Welcome to Econ Talk, brought to you by the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of George Mason University. My guest today is Darius Lakdawalla, an economist at the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica, California. He is also a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research and an associate professor of uh, <clears throat> and an associate professor of economics at the Party Rand Graduate School of Public Policy. Hi, Russ. Thanks for having me on. Oh, great to have you, Darius. You've done a lot of work on obesity and health, and I'd like to talk about that today. A lot of people. Uh, see obesity as a big social problem. Uh, we might talk about that later, but I want you to talk about the scope of the problem, the so-called problem, the nature of it. How are people getting fatter? Uh, is it is it true that somehow in the last few years P Americans are bigger? That's what we hear. Is it true? It's definitely true that Americans are getting fatter. Um, people all over the world are getting fatter, for that matter, uh, and it's been happening for centuries. So weights have been going up for a long time, and back in the 18th and 19th centuries, that was regarded as a good thing because people were moving from underweight and undernutrition um, to healthier weights and healthier nutritional status. But as we've gone farther and farther along down the road, we've now begun to encounter people entering overweight status. So really, this is a continuation of longstanding trends throughout the world um, that we're seeing in America uh, which is kind of the leading edge of this problem. What what are the magnitudes of those increases? You say people have gotten fatter. Let's let's stick with say America. How much fatter are we than we were say a, a century ago or two centuries ago? Well, the the century ago it's a little hard to answer quite precisely, but I'll I'll do my best in in a minute. Um I can say precisely over the last 30 to 40 years um the rates of obesity among Americans, which is defined typically as uh, as severe, unhealthy, overweight, rates of obesity have tripled uh, over the last 25 to 30 years, which is really a, a, an enormous increase. Has that severe, unhealthy, overweight definition been constant over that time period? It has, yes. So, um, How do you measure that? How's that defined? There's something that doctors call the body mass index, which is a way of measuring um, height-adjusted weight. So typically what it really is is just simply your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. Um, and that's typically used as – the reason that this index is used is it was found about a century ago to be well correlated with people's uh, survival experiences. So people with really low body mass index uh, tend to have higher mortality risk from being underweight. People who are kind of in the middle have the best experience and then people with very high body mass index tend to be um, also have elevated mortality risk from the problems associated with being overweight. So you say it's tripled. And give me some if it if it had tripled from uh, a half of one percent to one and a half percent, it wouldn't be so serious a right. problem. It's but what are the, what are the much, measures? It's it tripled from approximately uh, seven to eight percent to around between twenty and twenty five percent, depending on the group. Um, of Americans that you look at. So, so this is, I mean, I think that there are two things to note. One is that it's a big increase, 12, 13, 14 percent percentage points more people are obese. But the other thing is one in four Americans approximately are now obese, which is really a, quite a big number when it comes to um, defining a se fairly severe medical condition like obesity. So again, I want to be a little bit precise if we can. When you say that 22%, almost one in four Americans are obese, you're suggesting they're sufficiently overweight that their life expectancy is shorter than someone who is not obese. Um, Would that be accurate? That's pretty much accurate. The, the, the reason that I'm a little hesitant is that there are some people who argue that uh, being really heavy is okay for you if you're old. So among 60 to 70-year-olds, for example, um, there's not a consensus uh, that it's it's such a bad thing to be overweight. But mm. however, there is a, a, a strong consensus that if you're 20, 30, 40, or if you're a child, uh, that being obese is very bad for your health and damages your life expectancy. You want to make sure you reach 60 to 70. That's, I guess, that's, one of the... That's definitely true. Uh, or, by the way, are these obese people any happier than anybody else or less happy? Do we have any data on that? Do you know that's an excellent about? question. Um I, I haven't seen research on that, although I, I can't immediately think of uh, a way to address that question, but I think that there may be 
surveys that ask about both your body weight and your happiness. I have seen questions about where, where people are asked whether they're happy with their weight. Um, and the answer there t- tends to be that nobody's really happy with their weight, regardless of whether they are uh, obese, normal weight, or underweight. Yeah, that, that's um, that's a uh, probably a social phenomenon that you're yeah, supposed absolutely. to be uh, unhappy with your weight, whatever direction you think it, quote, ought to be. I mentioned the happiness thing because I think it's always a little strange that obesity is always described as a, as a problem. Of course, if you're eating ice cream a lot, Maybe you're really happy. You are overweight, but you know life is shorter but more pleasurable. It's possible. I, I always think it's strange that we never take account of that possibility. But no, I would definitely agree with that. I think that um, the way I look at the uh, growth and weight over time, uh, people have really been trading off uh, one thing for another. And what I mean by that is that people have decided to gain more weight because it's relatively cheap to do so, and it's it's nice to do the things that lead to higher weight, meaning it's nice to eat good food. Uh, it's nice not to have to work so strenuously um, at our at, at very physically demanding jobs or physically demanding housework. Um, so leisure uh, is is a good thing to enjoy, and sedentary leisure is a good thing to enjoy. And people are choosing those things over maintaining a healthy weight um, over the past centuries, really. Yeah. A couch potato is a happy potato, but uh, potentially at least. That's right. Uh, let's go, let's see, so we've talked about the last 30 years. Last 30 years, uh, a near tripling in obesity rates, or tripling from seven, roughly 7% to 22% among Americans. Right. Give me some historical perspective. Uh, take us back to an earlier time. This trend is is not new. The the rate of increase in obesity is perhaps it has accelerated. It sounds like, but it's not a new phenomenon that people are getting heavier. Right. That's right. So most of what we know about historical trends in the U.S. comes from the work of um, Robert Fogel, who's a very prominent Nobel Prize winning economic historian at the University of Chicago. And what what um, Dr. Fogel has done, he has looked at. Uh, the health records of Union Army veterans, um, where the Union Army followed uh, the status of their veterans from enlistment all the way through really the end of their lives as far as they could track them. So we have really detailed evidence on uh, what weights looked like, heights looked like, um, illness patterns, uh, mortality rates, which it's really kind of a remarkable data source that um, Dr. Fogel has done a lot of interesting work with. But one of the things that that data has been used for, it's been used by his colleagues, Dora Costa and, and Richard Steckel, to look at changes over time in people's weight. And by comparing the, the weight, or the height-adjusted weight, I should say, of Union Army veterans around the Civil War and tracking that over time all the way through uh, our weights today in the 20th century, what you see is that weights have gone up, depending on the age, uh, between, say, 10 15 percent. Um, over time, which is a fairly big number if you think about increasing your weight by 10 to 15 percent. Some ages, it's even as high as a 20 percent increase in weight, which is, um, and of course, that's that's for, from relatively severe underweight category to um, a healthier weight. So this is a sample based. It's, it's men only, presumably, right. and it's somewhat. Uh, it's not. It's not a random sample of Americans in in 1860s, but it's. That's right. It's a large sample. We know a lot about those folks. I assume they're taller also. I, we've gotten taller as we've well. We've gotten taller and we've gotten heavier and we've gotten heavier um, relative to our heights. So in other words, we're in, in some sense uh, fatter or more ample. I, I should say one other thing about that, that it, it's true that the Fogel sample was selected, um, but in the work that's been done, people have done, I think, some pretty useful types of comparisons. Uh, They've compared, for example, Union Army veterans to veterans of all the 20th century wars uh, that we've had. They've compared Union Army veterans to World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam veterans. And you see similar kinds of patterns. And that's a nice comparison because... That's a good control. Yeah, it's it's kind of a similar group over time to some extent. To some extent. It's a different, slightly different way we we got people into the Army over time. That's right. But it's an interesting, it's it's a very appropriate control. So... People have gotten taller, but controlling for height, uh, people of a particular height are heavier, correct? That's right. That's right. And how much heavier are we? 
Uh, well, in pounds, um, let's see. I would say this, these numbers are, are very approximate. I don't have the, the precise figures off the top of my head, but I would say that if you if you weigh, let's let's take the average weight, which is for men, let's say it's around 170 or so. Um, I would say that that man would probably have been about 150, 140s uh, about a century ago. So a man of quote average height, well not average height because that also has changed, but a five foot eleven person today weighs one seventy. A five foot eleven person in eighteen the eighteen sixties you say would weigh one forty, one fifty. Yeah, about say a little over ten percent less, I would say. By the way, did they lose weight over the war? Do you know that? Do you know? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I'm I sure bet that they did. it's known uh, <laughs> by by one of the researchers, but I don't know the answer. Yeah, to that. I bet they did. So. People have been getting heavier for a long time, and in recent years, they've gotten dramatically heavier, it sounds like. That's right. Uh, but but the length of that trend, going back a century or more, suggests that it isn't all due to McDonald's. Uh, oh, absolutely. Which, which, it's, not, it's not all due to McDonald's. Which some people seem to think of this this obesity uh, phenomenon is a some sort of nefarious uh, fast food advertising campaign being foisted on us, and somehow we can't help ourselves. And the next thing you know, we're eating a double cheeseburger with a jumbo fries and a milkshake, and right. we've gotten fat. But that's not what's going on. Yeah, I think that the the best thing to um, do first is to kind of point out that if that were true, if it were true that it's advertising that's caused all these um, changes in weight, what you'd really see is you'd see massive increases in the demand for food because advertising essentially stimulates demand. It makes people want to pay more for a given quantity of food. Um, but over time, what we've seen is completely inconsistent with huge increases in demand. We've actually seen food prices falling and falling and falling, not just over the past 30 years, but over the past 100, 120 years, uh, we've seen food getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, suggesting that it's not about McDonald's advertising, it's about farmers figuring out how to grow food more cheaply and, and more efficiently. And competition among farmers forcing them to pass on those cost savings in the form of lower relative prices, Right. in turn encouraging us at those lower prices as to always more. to go down our demand curves and, that's right. uh, and consume more. Uh, how, so that's part of the story, but that's not the whole story from your research. Is that correct? That's not the whole story. Um, and I should say, first of all, it's, it's, a, it's a really important part of the story over the past 30 years or so, um, that it's, really, it's, it's pretty hard to come up with alternatives and everything kind of lines up over the past couple of decades because food's getting cheaper plus calorically dense food is becoming particularly cheap uh, because there have been huge technological breakthroughs in the processing of fats and oils and very calorically dense prepared foods Meaning so all that stuff they've gotten on. those type of foods um the the really delightful foods, uh, ice cream, potato chips. What else are we talking about here? Well, basically, if you just think about a vending machine today, um, there's a lot of good stuff in a vending machine, uh, and it's also typically very calorically dense. Uh, vending machine foods 25, 30 years ago were not nearly as tasty because uh, food producers had not mastered the art of preserving food at, in a reasonably fresh and tasty state uh, for long periods of time. So a lot of it has to do with breakthroughs in the preservation of food um, that have both lowered the cost of food and increased the quality of these kinds of calorically dense prepared foods. You know, this reminds me of um, barbecue potato chips, which makes me salivate. Uh, I try <laughs> I try to stay away from them. I've been doing a good job lately, but but you're right that the range of choices in a vending machine today is very different than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. Right, and it continues to get wider. Do you know how they get the it aside? But a question I've always wondered about, and if you don't know, maybe some of our, our listeners know, how do they get the flavor into that potato chip in such a uniform, precise way? Because that's part of the technological change here, right? Right. If, if you and I were, were to make, if you and I were to make uh, barbecue flavored or jalapeno flavored potato chips. We'd slice up some potatoes, we'd dip them in hot oil, and when they came out, we'd shake some spices on them, and some of them yeah. would come out, you know, dark red, and some would come out barely with anything on them, and and it they might. How do they? Do you know how they do that? Well, I should say that all my knowledge of this comes from watching the Food Network, but uh, my important. understanding, based based on on watching those interesting documentaries, is 
that they use um, uniform spray nozzle technology to get these things on there. And they just lay out the chips on a big tra- – effectively a, a conveyor belt or a big tray and just – That's what I saw on the Food Network. So, okay. you know, it's not a scientific study, but uh, well, it might be true. It, it could be some kind of you – know, it could be like the landing on the moon, you know, just a hoax <laughs> They actually, um, you know, who knows what they actually. Now that sounds real. That sounds possible to me. It, spraying would be the, my one of my first guesses. Uh, but it, so this technology is advanced. Fattening food has gotten cheap, right. even even cheaper than non-fattening food. food. Right. Uh, so food overall has gotten cheaper relative to non-food, and then this uh, calorically dense food has gotten cheaper relative to other kinds of food. And I should point out here that. Um, when I say I use this this complicated phrase, calorically dense food. I like for, that. It's for, it sounds for, like fattening, but it's not. Is that it's not, not quite? <laughs> because I, I deliberately want to avoid using the word word fatty food. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Because there really isn't a whole lot of evidence to 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 suggest that it's high fat foods in and of themselves that make people fat. It's more that calories uh, make people fat. So foods that are just high in calories, whether or not they're high in fat, carbohydrates, protein, whatever it is. Um, or if you look at people's dietary intakes over the past 30 years, one of the striking things that, that you'll see is that they're getting heavier, um, but their dietary composition isn't changing that much. So when I, when I say that, I mean that the ratio of fats to proteins to carbohydrates and all that. There's a little bit of an increase in carbs, but not so much. It's really just about the fact that people are just eating way more calories than they were in the 70s. So it's it's not the fact they're eating the higher calorie food, but just the total calories are higher? Well, I think it, it is the fact that we're eating the higher calorie food, but it's not necessarily that we're eating food that's higher in fat oh, um, controlling for calories. So it's all about it's whenever you put calories into your body, regardless of how they're, they're composed, that's going to, over time, um, increase your body weight. But I thought... Um... I thought I read in, in in a paper you wrote that total calorie intake isn't that much higher. Well, is that correct? Or so not? at the very start of the, this mini conversation here, we uh, um, I focused on the past thirty years for this little discussion, and in fact, over the past thirty years, calorie intake has increased a lot, um, even though compositions of diets have not. Now, if you go back a little farther, and this is kind of what you alluded to earlier, that it's not all about food prices all the time. If you go back a little farther in the 20th century, say to the post-World War II period, you'll find episodes where Americans were getting fatter even though calorie intake was flat or declining. And that's where I think another piece of the puzzle comes in, and that is that our um, lifestyles have changed. We no longer engage in the very physically demanding jobs that we used to engage in. Um, housework has become a lot easier and less less demanding over time. Leisure has become more sedentary than it used to be. I mean, you can sit and watch TV, um, which you couldn't necessarily do at the turn of, of the 20th century. So all these things have changed people's activity patterns, and that has definitely played a role in the long-run history of weight growth in America. But not so much in the last 30 years, because even, I suppose, 30 years ago, we had a pretty sedentary work Right. Well, I think that um, experience. we've looked a lot for evidence that, of what role this has played over the past 30 years. And it just it's kind of hard to find. Part of that is that it's hard to measure these things. It's hard to measure activity and uh, whether activity is sedentary or not. So I, I'm not 100% confident that it hasn't played a role. But I, I will say that it's been hard to find evidence. It's just a lot easier to find evidence um, in for earlier periods where it's, it's just clearly obvious that it has to be physical activity that's changing. If you think about the workplace, uh, the decline in in agriculture, mining, uh, forestry, uh, the most physically demanding jobs that were common 100 years ago are dramatically less common today, but they've been less common for a long time. That's correct. So that's got to be part of the that's story. Correct. The leisure thing's another interesting uh, phenomenon, though. Um, of course, on the flip side, there's there's been a, a, a an increase in uh, exercise for exercise's sake that would have been absurd 50 or 100 years ago. The idea of jogging, the idea of deliberately right. burning calories, playing racquetball or or a triathlete to take an, an extreme would be viewed as insane by right. someone in 18, 1850 or 1900. It all kind of makes sense that we're in this situation now because I mean, in, in the 19th century, for example, um, people were paid 
to burn calories. They were paid to do things to, that made themselves thin. Uh, but today, you're actually paid not to do those things. You're paid to sit at your desk. Well, not everybody, I should say, but more workers today than, than used to be are paid to sit at their desks and not exercise. Um, and so now we have to pay ourselves in, in the form of foregone leisure or you know, just sometimes directly with gym memberships and, and so forth um, to be able to burn calories and keep our weights down. It would be an interesting idea for a new fitness center you know, called Slop the Hogs. You know, you'd, you'd show up early. Instead of getting on the Stairmaster, you'd go out and wrestle with some pigs and throw out the, uh, the slop or whatever. Yeah, and maybe, maybe it makes your food even cheaper than it already is. Yeah, that's true. It could have even that, that extra counter, <laughs> counterweight uh, effect. That would not be so good. But it, it's a great observation, the, um, the change in who pays whom in that situation. So, yeah, we, we – we are paid to be sedentary, and we pay in turn to exercise and and be active. It's a it's a strange uh, shift in, in act, human activity, right. and that's an act, a change that's very dramatic in America and other parts of the world that has not changed. So I assume in those countries, if you look, we've been talking mostly about the United States. I assume if we looked internationally, uh, the obesity uh, picture is a little more complicated. It is, um, and there's a lot to be learned from the international comparisons. It's uh, the, the countries with the biggest changes in weight have tended to be the English-speaking countries, um, Britain, Australia, the United States, and Canada. Um, now, there are some theories about why that's the case. Some economists have observed that these are also, at least relatively, uh, less protected agricultural markets hmm. that have experienced bigger declines in food prices than the more protected markets of continental Europe and, and even Japan. So, um, so, so the, some, go ahead. I was just going to say, so the Soviet Union, which you know had uh, you know seventy years in a row of bad harvests <clears throat> uh, because of weather, at least that was the official line. Even though their people nearly and often did starve to death, at least they don't have an, they didn't have an obesity problem for a while. That That's would be right. the, uh, <laughs> the the story. They also didn't have a falling mortality problem either. Yeah, um, yeah, that that's a, a shame. So. Uh, the English-speaking nations, which tend to be freer agriculturally, or at least uh, not protective, they they do other things to their agricultural markets, but they don't artificially uh, keep the price. Or high. as much. I mean, that there certainly is protectionism in all of those countries, including the U.S. But just re- compared to the continental European countries, it's it's certainly less protected. I would argue. So, what if you looked across? But if you looked across uh, countries that are relatively similar in their protectionist. If you just looked at income difference, I'm trying to get it away from the food thing for a moment and get at this right. lifestyle issue. There, there are many countries that don't have the uh, the large uh, service sector that the United States has, which tend to have, which tend to ha- tends to have more sedentary uh, right. occupational uh, activity. What what do we know about those countries? Well, if you look at um, so if you look across countries today, and you just kind of take a snapshot of the world, uh, the general fact is that. Weights are higher in richer countries. So uh, the poorer the country is, the, the lower is, is the weight of the average person. Now, it's kind of interesting that if you look within a country, that relationship does not necessarily hold. Uh, in fact, the richest people in the U.S. are not the fattest people. Um, in fact, they, they are thinner than many people in the middle class. I think that sheds light on, on some of what's going on here, that at the country level, income differences are generated primarily by these big technological differences. We do much different work um, than workers in uh, the less developed African economies, for example. And that, that is really kind of the biggest difference between an American worker and an African worker is, is we just simply do very different things with our day. Less physical in That's America. That's right, much less, physical, much, much less physically demanding work and also much cheaper food here than over there, much more freely available and, and accessible food in the U.S. And you also make the point in your writings that it's the home life is also less – you alluded to it earlier. The home life is more sedentary here in the United States, not just the work life. So if you're producing uh, – uh, if you're doing things at home, in America, a lot of those things are relatively sedentary because we've got higher income and we can afford to buy labor-saving devices. Absolutely. In poorer countries, they're doing them – quote, by hand. They're washing their clothes by hand, more likely. They're Dishes and, right. Everything like that. Right. Yeah, that's true, that there, there's so many labor-saving devices that, and it kind of goes back to your point that 
we ought to think about happiness here. And certainly uh, dishwashers are great, washing machines are great, but they do decrease the amount of physical activity that's demanded of um, housework. But I, you know, I would argue that's a good trade-off. Absolutely. Like people that. are clearly revealing that they would prefer that trade-off. So, I, But I interrupted you. So across countries, uh, because of both factors, l- lifestyle and uh, food prices, richer countries are often fatter than poorer countries. But within a poor country or within a rich country, if you look across income groups – you're saying that often that pattern does not hold. That's right. And, and if you think about, so let's take, let's start with within a rich country, because um, the story is a little bit, um, it's actually more interesting in a rich country than a poor country, more different, I should say, than a rich country than a poor country. So if you look at rich people in the U.S., what's different about a rich worker and a poor worker? Well, it's not really true that the poor worker is going to necessarily be doing much more strenuous activity at work. Uh, the poor worker might be in a clerical job, a service sector job that isn't actually all that taxing, whereas the rich worker is also probably sitting at a desk. It's not about that. It's simply about the fact that the rich worker tends to have higher demands for health uh, than the poor worker. And so that higher demand for health corresponds to a demand for a a lower weight, a healthier weight um, than the poorer worker would have. Of course, there's an offsetting aspect to this, and that's why the relationship is complicated in in the United States and other rich countries, and that is that, of course, people like to eat. And any any good that people like tends to be positively associated with income. So the richer you are, the more food you eat. But at some point, that's kind of dominated by the fact that the richer you are, the more health you would like to purchase for yourself. Well, let's talk about that because I think that may be confusing to some of our listeners. What do you mean the rich have a higher demand for health? You don't think poor people want to be healthy? Oh, absolutely. They want. They would want to be healthy. So uh, what does that mean exactly? It means that uh, – so everybody wants to be healthy. Health is a good in that sense. That, you know, Everybody would prefer more health to less health. Um, but just like anything else, richer people can afford to buy more health, just like they can afford to buy bigger houses and fancier cars and more of a, anything else that, that they uh, prefer – to use. Um, so I think that, that health is a good just like any other in that respect, that richer people um, can afford to buy more of it uh, just like they can afford to buy more of anything else. So they're going to be doing activities that that are costly, like joining the gym, uh, that are um, – they're likely to demand more medical care. I'm, I'm trying to think right. of ways this would actually work out because there are lots of uh, low-cost alternatives to the gym, which is you know running around the block works as well. It's not as interesting. It's not as entertaining. You know, one thing that's kind of relevant to note here is that um, in in the study of health economics, perhaps the one fact that is really just impossible to overturn is that anywhere you look and anyhow you cut it, any way you cut it, uh, richer people are healthier than poorer people. And we're we're not totally sure why that is. We kind of have some understanding that um, richer people have have stronger incentives to take care of their bodies um, for various reasons because they have to protect their upfront investments in education, uh, just because they have more money to spend on uh, expensive health care and, and health promotion activities. But I think the, the important point to, to make here is that weight is just like other types of health behaviors. And richer people tend to be healthy on any number of dimensions, and I think weight is just another one of those dimensions. I, I want to clarify one thing here. When you say richer people, you don't mean, as is often invoked in these kind of conversations, the rich and then the rest of us. No. You don't just mean that – You know, sometimes when you're talking about richer, you're, you're, we're not just talking about the society pages or uh, the the super rich. We're talking about a continuum here that – that as people get wealthier and, and have higher material well-being and higher standard of living, they tend to be healthier, right? And it's not right. its not just a, if you can somehow get into that top 20% or top 1%, you're going to be healthier because you can afford this stuff. It's a, its a continuum of choices and, and, and uh, ability to, to – and, and preference for, for choosing health, correct? Right. So let me put it another way that probably makes it a little bit clearer. Uh, if you look at, at any type of health outcome that you'd like to look at, things like – you know, uh, hypertension, diabetes, even mortality rates. It's true that high school graduates are healthier than high school dropouts. Um, People who went to college typically are healthier than just people who simply graduated high school. And then people who graduated from college are healthier than all those groups. So these are 
these are not super rich people. You know, these are we're talking about high school graduates having a benefit relative to high school dropouts. Right. And so these are really uh, representative large groups in American society that we're talking about. Now you chose those groups because I presume I presume you chose those because they're correlated with with income roughly, right? right. The more education you have, the the higher your income. It's probably but, actually the best way to measure income for um, from many economic points of view because you're really interested in um, somebody's lifetime income and the fact that. The kid in college is reporting very little income. Isn't that informative? Because right. the kid in college realizes that he or she has pretty good lifetime earnings prospects, and so we ought to account for that fact when comparing that kid to um, the kid who didn't go to college and is working at um, a, a less skilled job and maybe has higher income for the moment, but certainly does not have higher lifetime income prospects. But you would not suggest, I assume, that somehow college or high school people because they're more educated than high school dropouts somehow are able to take care of themselves better? Or do you think there's there any evidence on that? There is evidence of that, but I would say that there, there's also evidence that that's not the whole issue. So I, I would say that um, there's no question in my mind that income in and of itself is important. But there is also evidence um, that people who, with more schooling seem to be better able to take care of themselves. Now, I will say, though, that it's always really, really hard to disentangle kind of this pure, I don't know what you want to call it, knowledge effect from the fact that people with more schooling are always going to have more income. So I think that that's, that's typically an unsettled question because it's so hard to disentangle the two. But I, well, I think guess... that there's a lot of evidence that income itself matters. I guess we'll just watch Bill Gates, right? He's really rich. Did he finish college? I don't believe he I, did. I think so he's a college he's, dropout. So he's in the college dropout group. It's a small sample, though. I don't think we want to rely on it. Probably um, not. So basically what you, what you said is that – let me summarize. People are heavier than they were 30 and longer – many more years ago than that for, for a couple of reasons. Food's cheaper, so we're eating more of it. Uh, the fattiest food is cheaper – That excuse me, the most – the highest caloric food is cheaper, right? and so uh, people are buying a little bit more of that even, and our lifestyles are such that we're more sedentary. So That's right. what's the, um, what does the future hold? Um, Seems like a, uh, you know, we might be worried. Global warming, which uh, people are worried about, might pale in comparison to this issue of throwing the planet off its orbit as we get <laughs> heavier and heavier. I mean, what's the, both, all those trends seem to me point in the same direction. Well, I would say probably global warming is clearly a bigger public policy problem than uh, weight, in my opinion, at least. And I, that, I'd say that because it's not entirely obvious to me um, what the public policy issue is here. I mean, a lot of what's been going on uh, has to do with private decision making, people deciding to um, eat more and exercise less because those things have gotten cheaper and choosing to weigh more as a result. Um, the question is, how much of this is just individuals deciding what's best for themselves versus how much of this is individuals having unregulated impacts on, on others. And there's some of that unregulated impacts on others going on. So I don't want to say that this is not a public policy issue at all. But most of the time, that happens through things like health insurance pools. So the fact that I'm in a health insurance pool at my company with people who don't take care of their weight, that clearly adversely impacts me because I have to pay higher premiums as a result of their behavior. And in, according to many current regulations, insurance companies have a hard time rating group health insurance premiums according to weight. So Is they it can't charge the law? my heavier coworkers Is more. it against the law to charge um, your heavier coworker more for, for, their, for their insurance? I'm not sure if it's against the law in the group health market, to be perfectly honest. Um, interesting it's, it's question. It's never done. Yeah, it isn't done. Um, I, I'm a little bit skeptical about the – the health effects of of obesity. I th obviously, at the high end, somebody who is um, 50, 100, 200 pounds overweight, it's clear to me that that is not good for you. Well, let's distinguish between the health effects and the health spending effects. I mean, it oh, may be point. true that, that health <laughs> effects are small, but I think it's pretty well documented that heavier people spend more on medical care at any number. And, and that's true even when you compare you know, overweight people to normal weight people or somewhat obese people to overweight people. So that's a that puzzle that, that as to why insurance companies don't um, charge different rates then. Um, right. I think that um, in the group health market, 
um, well, they don't even charge different rates. Many companies don't charge different rates for smokers uh, than for non-smokers. So I think that weight is not the only issue here. Well, smoking's hard to measure, right? It, you, you don't want to follow a person around. and. Well, no, you, know, you some... can measure smoking pretty well by taking a, a a saliva sample and oh, testing can? it for cotinine. Okay. So you could, you know, just like you could weigh somebody, you could just have somebody spit in a cup and um, you could shortly determine whether mm. they've smoked in the last, you know, 10 to 15 days. That's surprising. That's interesting. Well, we'll, we'll leave that for another time. Let's go back to your main point, which is this is mainly a personal choice. There are some side effects, financial side effects, monetary side effects. Right. Um, but uh, the this role of personal responsibility is, is I think, an important one to emphasize. It's, it's often a word I despise linked to obesity is the word epidemic. Mm-hmm. When the word epidemic is used, it, it suggests it's some uh, bacteria creeping through the uh, the water system that somehow infects you, and the next thing you know, oh, you're fat. But it's right. clearly not that, as you point out. It's clearly overwhelmingly the result of personal choices in response to incentives. Well, I will temper that with, with one point, because um, I don't want to go too overboard on this. That it's, it's probably true that certain people are predisposed to being fatter than other people. But what I, I do think is also clear is that certainly our genes haven't changed in 30 years or even 100 years. So the fact that the, the average person is fatter today than in 1975 or 1976 uh, that's not because the average person has different genes. But there a, certainly are people who are more disposed to being fat in the population. But the change in weight we've seen over time has got to be the result of personal choice. And so let's go back to that question of the future. Uh, given that technology is going to continue to lower the price of food, you know, it's gotten to the point now where you know serving sizes are are, are large because people like to eat, and it's it's re- that extra bit of food is so inexpensive to, to right. provide. So that's going to continue to happen. That's right. We're going to continue to stay at desks rather than toil in the mines or the forests or the fields. Uh, are you su- You're suggesting we're going to get fatter and fatter. Um, I don't think that we're going to get fatter and fatter indefinitely because we did have this discussion before about how richer people – uh, demand more health. And mm-hmm. I think that at some point you enter um, a level of income where uh, people now want to be provided with healthier food that's going to make them live longer and make them weigh less. So I think that that is that is an effect over time that would, would lead to lower weights. It just has been overwhelmed um, in the past by the effects of cheaper food and, and more sedentary activities. At some point, though, the richer we get, the more important that effect is going to become. So and eventually, I, this is going to be self-limiting to some extent, I think, as people demand um, different weight outcomes for themselves. No, I think that's exactly right. I think that's a great point. I, presumably, technology is going to not just lower the price of food. It's going to do all kinds of other unimagined things. Uh, right. you, know, you know, While you're sitting at your desk surfing the Internet for work or pleasure, you'll get, you know, your computer will give you a liposuction. You know, you'll... Uh, you know who knows what's uh, what's coming. Yeah, my credit card's wait, waiting for that one to happen. <laughs> well, it's actually you know I always feel like you know, you're swiping the credit card sufficiently many times. You're burning a few calories there too. I, I found that technology. It's it's a little disappointing. I wish it were more. Uh, but seriously, I think there will be uh, obviously there will be all kinds of technological changes in in the both how fattening food is and the ways that we exercise and in the medical in uh, technology that, that treats and deals with the effects right. of obesity. And that's something we ha- we haven't touched on, that um, there's also a huge incentive now for there to be new medical breakthroughs that make it less costly or less unhealthy to be overweight. So I suppose one possible outcome, um, you know, I, I certainly don't want to rule it out, is that uh, maybe medicine figures out a way for uh, to essentially erase or largely erase the adverse health effects, although that is Nobody in the medical profession is forecasting that, so I just put that out as a hypothetical possibility rather than a prediction. No, I think that's a good prediction. Uh, if, as you say, if we continue to get wealthier, which I think we will, uh, there's going to be an enormous profit profit opportunity, unless we mess up the way we pay for health care, which right. always, that's always a possibility. Right. As long as we leave in a profit incentive for people to uh, 
come up with new technologies, devices, and treatments that will reduce the um, effects of weight gain, I'm sure those effects will be uh, mitigated by innovation. I would agree with that. Let's talk, we're almost out of time, but let, let's talk briefly about norms. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing, um, what is socially acceptable weight and our clothes. There's a whole technology of clothing we haven't talked about to either mask or reveal right. uh, how much a person weighs. Uh, baggy clothes can come in and out of fashion versus tight clothes. Uh, certain looks are socially acceptable within certain cultures. Um, what role does that play in this? Uh, I think it may well play a role. I just think it's really hard to know what role it plays. I mean, there's always a question of uh, do norms produce new behaviors or do new behaviors make it acceptable to do that? So, for example, um, now that we have more people who are overweight, do other people then decide that it's acceptable, that it's common and okay to be heavy? Or do we have a lot of people who are overweight because at some point somebody flipped a switch and made it acceptable to be heavy? I think there's a, there's a chicken and egg problem uh, in thinking about norms. But I do think that there's no question that our perceptions of what constitutes an ideal weight matter. So people who um, feel that they're too heavy are more likely to try to lose weight, and people who feel that they're not heavy enough are more likely to try to gain weight. So there's no question that attitudes matter. It's just really hard to tease out, I think, um, what the uh, actual real-world contribution of those changing norms has been over time. Anything else um, in this area that you think is of interest, either in terms of research or policy, that we haven't talked about? Any? Where do you think people are going to be uh, studying this, as, as economists anyway? Well, actually, we, we have talked a little bit about health insurance, and I think that um, there is a really interesting and important public policy question um, concerning uh, the extent to which we want to insure people against being heavy. So currently our approach is to say that if you're heavy, it's a risk. It, you've kind of got a bad draw, right? You, you, you rolled the dice and it didn't work out for you. And so we're going to insure you against your unlucky draw. We treat it the same way we would treat cancer. Right. Just bad That's luck. Right. It's not your fault. That's right. And and there's there's a certain logic to that. I mean, it is true that there are people who do get a bad draw in terms of their genetic makeup, and it, it is very difficult for them to lose weight compared to other people. On the other hand, it's also undoubtedly true that people can and do change their weight by modifying their behavior and making personal choices um, above and beyond what their genetic makeup is. And those kinds of choices you don't want to insure people against because you're just discouraging them from taking responsibility and regulating their own weight. So there's a, there's a really complex and important question to answer here. To what extent does society want to um, provide a safety net for people who end up at an unhealthy weight? And to what extent does society want to encourage people to maintain a healthy weight by paying their own costs of being overweight? And uh, where do you stand on that? I actually don't think that we know enough um, to make a really well-reasoned uh, determination on that question yet. I don't think we know enough about the relative contribution of genetics and personal choice um, to say how contracts ought to be designed. But I think that that's why it's a, it's a hugely important area of research because we have these, these health insurance systems, both private and public in the United States, uh, that are being affected by this, ep this epidemic, that so-called epidemic, um, and so we need to know whether it is a problem that we insure people against their weight or whether that's the right thing to do, and we just don't have enough information at this time to, to know that. But it is clear that in today's insurance uh, environment, we do subsidize uh, what we might call unhealthy behavior. Um, we make uh, our coworkers pay for our cholesterol-thinning uh, drugs, and I I guess I'd, That's right. I'd be um, eager to see how the market would uh, turn out if, if the regulatory environment let insurance companies um, price a little more in a more discriminating fashion. But uh, you do make an interesting point about this metabolism or genetic genetic issue. Uh, to me, it seems overwhelmingly true that a huge part of it is personal choice, and I don't really want to pay for somebody to sit on the couch. If they want to sit on the couch – and eat and eat a gallon of ice cream a day, you know, 
they're welcome to make that choice as long as they pay the cost. For me to pay for the cost of that activity seems wrong. Well, that's that's certainly a um, a reasonable point of view, I would think. I think that that there is, I would agree, a hundred percent that there is there is a significant and demonstrable component of personal choice, and so I think that the emphasis or the the view of obesity as um, an epidemic that is victimizing people is just not entirely accurate. There is certainly a component of choice here that people are choosing, making a conscious decision to weigh more, but in exchange, they're getting things they like. They're getting more sedentary leisure. They're getting more food. Um, so it's definitely not obvious that it's making them worse off overall. All right, which is which is great for them. I, you know, I, have, no, I have no problem with people choosing that voluntarily as long as they don't have the opportunity to impose the... The, the cost of that on other on other people, right? But I think that we just need to understand a little more about um, the the dynamics of choice versus risk and genetic risk in particular. And that, that I think that's uh, that is knowledge we really need to have. Um, we, there's there's just volumes and volumes of research on obesity, but I think there's this important question that we know very little about. Well, I'm sure we'll learn more. Um, I think we will. Uh, although I have to say, with you know, with Sunday night football now making. Uh, a mainstream uh, impact. People are going to sit and watch football for ten plus hours on Sunday. They still got the Monday night thing working. They got the college games on Saturday. It's going to be a tough struggle. Well, we know that increases happiness, so there's no research required on that. <laughs> My guest today has been Darius Lakdawalla of the Rand Corporation. He's also a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research and an associate professor of economics at the Party Rand Graduate School of Public Policy. You've, you can find additional readings and links uh, related to this topic of today on obesity at econtalk.org, econtalk.org, as well as other podcasts. Thanks for listening.